I'm pretty sure I would barricade myself in my room if I heard a weird noise, especially in a house that I didn't know. Hi everyone, welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I'm Tina. Uh, this is my book review wrap up for February. Um, February was kind of a boring month. Uh, it was my anniversary and Valentine's Day and family day here in Ontario. Um, but two of these consisted of, you know, just ordering in slightly more expensive food. And the other, my family and I just did like a walk in the conservation area near my house. So, you know, not super exciting, but <laughs> Whatever, saving money. I read five books in February. Three I'm gonna do a regular review of. Uh, one I'm gonna give a very short review of, and the other I'm gonna be reviewing on March 9th, which I will explain. <laughs> so this month I'm finally gonna post my library tour. When, uh, I'm not sure, it's taking me a long time to put it together. <laughs> I'm gonna be doing a classic uh, sci-fi review of Andre Norton's Sargasso of Space on March 18th. Hopefully. I'm going to be doing a review of Becky Chambers' fourth Wayfair novel, The Galaxy and the Ground Within. I think I'm going to do that probably on like the 24th or 25th, but I'm debating because I can't get the paperback here until May. And to ship it from the UK would just be stupid. <laughs> but I don't want to pay $17 for the Kindle because that's ridiculous for an ebook. I have an Audible credit though that would give it to me for free. <sighs> Or I could just wait until May. The problem is that book club that I'm part of, um, Interstellar Book Club, which is really fun, they're reading it this month, and I don't want to wait, you know, to to review it two months from now, but I don't want to pay $17 for the ebook. I'm having, I'm actually having like real difficulty here deciding if I want to drop $17 in the ebook and then end up paying probably $25 for the paperback later, because I want to have the whole collection in paperback, because I have the first three. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, you'll find out, I guess, on uh, like the 25th or so what, what I did. And I'm also going to be doing my favorite sci-fi books, sci-fi fantasy books on um, March 30th. So hopefully, depending on how the library tour goes, because that is taking me so long. I mean, I have, I have like almost a thousand books. It's been taking me a while to, to do this. <laughs> anyway, blah, blah, blah. Um, on to my actual review. So the first book that I read in February was Skyward Inn by... Um, Alia, 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 I'm assuming, uh, Whiteley, which is a science fiction. I received it as an ARC from NetGalley in exchange for a fair review, so it's actually not out yet. It comes out this month. I read it on my Kindle Fire. So, Skyward Inn is a ponderous, melancholy exploration into memory, community, and colonialism. The story follows two perspectives, that of Jem and her semi-estranged son, Foss. Fossey, I'm assuming, who live in this area of England that has annexed itself from the rest of the world. Jem operates a bar with Isley, an alien, from Kita. I'm assuming it's Kita. It's Q-I-T-A. Um, a planet that Earth has conquered, but without any kind of fight or battle. So this visitor arrives at their bar, bringing them, you know, a change and some revelations about the war and humanity, and that's kind of the plot. So this is definitely on the slower, more speculative side of science fiction. It somehow manages to be both deeply interesting and somewhat dry, as in like a little dull, at the same time. I don't mean it was boring, but it's more about style and substance until about the last quarter of the book. That being said, I did very much enjoy it. I give, you know, the prose and readability a 5 out of 5. You know, it's, it's, there's some beautifully wrought sentences. I found the story very easy to follow and understand, despite the kind of nonlinear way that it's sometimes told. I like that we had two perspectives and that Fosse's journey mimicked his mother's in many ways, so it's very cyclical. Um, I like how information was revealed in a backwards manner and assumptions were countered or solidified later. Like, you'll make your own assumption about something, but then, you know, the story will contradict that or reinforce that later, which is a really interesting way of doing it and I really kind of appreciate that. It made you kind of call yourself out on your own assumptions. That being said, I found the characters a little lacking. Fosse was interesting in how he's developed some complexes from having a semi-absent mother and a domineering adopted father, his uncle. His motivations and actions made sense to me though, and he was wrestling with his morality and sexuality and that was very understandable given his age and his kind of situation. Jem, unfortunately, was very bland. 
I found her perspective on her relationship, or kind of lack of relationship with Fosse, too simplistic and often contradictory. Like, it, I mean, I understand that it would be, it would be conflicted, but it didn't seem like she put a lot of kind of effort into worrying about this. Um, her relationship with Isley the alien was nowhere near as torturous as an unrequited love theme could have been. Uh, I mean, it all makes, everything makes sense, but a little less logic and a little bit more emotion would have made her character more interesting to me. I didn't understand why she was attracted to the alien at all, and that's not because he's an alien. I mean, Garrus from Mass Effect is my, like, celebrity pass, uh, so, you know, it wouldn't take a lot to convince me that she would bone an alien, but, um, it just didn't, I didn't understand their connection more than that, and I didn't really care about what happened to her because I didn't really know her, I felt. I gave the plot a similar kind of lesser ranking, as there were times when I wondered where the story was going. I really enjoyed the twist, as it was a revelation with some fascinating implications surrounding human aggression and colonialism. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing, nothing surprising about human nature, but still. Um, I didn't understand what aspect of it. I'm going to talk about it, so jump to this spot here to avoid the spoiler, and then I'm just going to wrap it up after that. Regarding the fusing, of all the people and, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I didn't understand how Jem could just reject it. Wouldn't more people just reject it? Like, wouldn't there be some resistance? Like, if I saw my family being fused into this weird blob, I'm pretty sure I would react the same way Jem was and resist it. Like, I don't know. It just seemed like kind of a weird, weird that she would be able to escape. I would have made more sense to me if she had been fused as well. I don't know. I, I just don't understand why she why she was able to to leave this, you know, escape the process. And also, while I know it's not the same thing at all, <laughs> the Keatons or Cutons or whatever they're called, they really reminded me of the Changelings from Star Trek DS9. <laughs> and then all I could think of was Isley looking like Odo, and I couldn't picture anything else, and it kind of ruined the story for me because I was like, oh man. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's kind of the end of my spoilers. That was a short little spoilers. Uh, that being said, Skyward Inn is a thought-provoking, calm story about assimilation and choice. I do give it a four to five stars, despite some of the things I didn't like about it, and I recommend it to those who like their sci-fi more thoughtful than action-packed. There were some really nice quotes from it. Um, there's, it's a soft gray bleed from night into morning, which I thought was pretty. Um, the bliss of empty forgotten buildings which I totally agree with. If you watch any of my other videos, you know that I am obsessed with abandoned buildings. So this that kind of spoke to me on, a, on an emotional level. And then she talks about America and she says, the excess, the disposability, the opulence of their air conditioning running from coal while the world burned has become legendary. And yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure that they'll be talking about that kind of thing in the history books if we make it past, you know, 2050. <laughs> So the next book that I that I read was 14 by Peter Kleins. This is a mystery horror sci-fi. I listened to this novel as an audiobook from Audible. It was my first audiobook and I was very happy with the experience and I will definitely listen to another. In fact, I'm listening to another right now. Uh, not right now, but you know what I mean. I heard of this book and the audiobook from the blog Writing in Obscurity. So 14 is an older book. I think it's from 2012. Uh, it's perfect for those who enjoy a mixed genre story with, uh, you know, light horror and sci-fi elements that's heavy on the mystery and features a cast of fun characters. It's definitely not scary. So if you're going into it wanting to be scared, it's not scary. It's creepy. Um, it's more about the mystery than it is about, like, scaring you. So the what's it about? You've got Nate. He's an underachiever in this dead-end kind of low-paying job. He lands this sweet, cheap apartment in an old building because he needs a cheap apartment. <laughs> he notices some strange things that tries to ignore them. Um, out of boredom, or maybe a subconscious need to kind of do something with his life, he starts researching the building. His questions and discoveries eventually bring in some of the other tenants, and the group unearths something that has been hidden for over a century. I'm a big fan of horror that has like a reason behind it. You know, I want to know why someone is being haunted or the ghost origin story. That's not really like, kind of like the conjuring, that kind of stuff. I like when there's like a backstory. Or there was one called, um, a state of the dark or something like that. I really liked kind of the backstory of that one because it explained why these particular people were being haunted. I prefer a well wrought mystery over to being actual, actually being scared. I really enjoy the way the mystery unfolded. I found that the slowness at which this occurred makes sense. Like Nate and no, everyone else aren't in danger. In fact, they have to tread lightly in this mystery or they might get kicked out of their building. 
So I really like this aspect because it allowed the characters to go from strangers to actual friends. A lot of time in these horror books it's you know like one day or three days or something and they have to deal with this ghost in this house and you know people bond but in this they bond over the course of months. They actually feel like they're friends. I didn't love any of them that kind of like to pieces but I did care about them and I did like them. I liked pretty much all the characters. I thought Nate was a smart choice as the main protagonist because he's kind of a humdrum like every man kind of dude who just needs some impetus to kind of like step up. Uh, some of the other characters will almost turn into stereotypes like there's Zila, the artist, who sunbathes nude, you know, on the roof for example, but she's given more of a backstory and she diverges from her prescribed role and no longer becomes kind of a stereotype. Uh, another example, there's another another woman named Debbie who seems like this kind of housewifey, kind of traditionalist, like goody-goody, but she's also this brilliant scientist who helps, you know, decipher a lot of the clues. I really liked how they, like, didn't just leave her as a kind of like a background character like she would have been in most of these kind of stories. And as someone who really enjoys a slow burn romance, there's a small subplot and I thought it was very cute and I really liked it. Uh, there was one character I really didn't like, Andrew, and he was really fun to not like. And then there's another character named Mandy who I also didn't like, but I think we're supposed to not like her and as well as kind of feel sorry for her. Anyway, the, char the characters are really fun. The star of the story though is the Cabbage building itself. Each room holds like a new piece of the mystery and they have to kind of like, there's things that are locked, they have to unlock things. Like that. It's, it's really fun. It almost feels like an escape room when you're reading it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I'd been reading the book rather than listening to it, I wouldn't have been able to put it down. The mystery itself was very easy to follow and try to find, it was fun to try to predict what was going to happen. I know enough about Lovecraftian horror to start piecing it together about halfway through, but nothing about it was obvious from the get-go. There were some other references too to like other horror sci-fi movies such as Aliens that were dropped here and there that I liked. I mean there were some that I admit that I didn't pick up on because they, I just, you can't read and watch everything, but uh, there were enough that I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, okay. <laughs> the ending didn't drag a little bit though. The pacing was a bit off sometimes, but I did enjoy the whole book, and um, I would definitely read another by Peter Klein's, and I'm pretty sure that this one is part of a series, so I could read the other two, maybe, or three, or however there are. I'm giving it a four or five stars, actually. I recommend it to anybody that loves kind of Lovecraftian horror, mystery, and a horror that isn't very scary. It's just a, it's just a fun novel. It was a really good audiobook. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I actually found myself paying attention. Sometimes I zone out when it comes to audiobooks, so this was good. The third book that I read was The Haunting of Gillespie House by Darcy Coates, or Cates, or however you say her name. So, another horror. Weird. Uh, this is a ghost story. I bought it for 99 cents off BookBub. <laughs> One of my friend's last names used to be Gillespie, so I sent her a screenshot with a laughing emoji being like, oh, look, your house is haunted. And then she was like, oh, it's 99 cents. I'm like, yeah. And so we decided we'd just read it together because it was really short. It's almost a novella. Like, it's very short. Um, I read it on my Kindle Fire. If you like old mansions and hauntings that are creepy but not disturbing and a nice little twist, it's a fun little short novel. Uh, the story follows Elle... Uh, as she house sits in this gothic mansion, of course there's a locked room, a creepy attic, a graveyard, a mausoleum, and a bar across the doors, you know, strange noises abound, and Elle is drawn to this mystery sparked by odd dreams. Typical kind of haunted house crap. The novel, you know, starts slowly and builds to an interesting peak that balances mystery with action. Sometimes in horror the characters stay in the haunted house or whatever it is, like for far too long, then you, you would, you know, it doesn't seem logical that you would stay. But I don't think Elle made any real irrational decisions. I mean, sometimes I was like, I don't think I would wander around my house in the middle of the dark with just a candlestick. I'm pretty sure I would barricade myself in my room if I heard a weird noise, especially in a house that I didn't know. But maybe she's braver than me, or maybe, I don't know. She... So that was kind of an unrealistic thing, is that I don't think she acted kind of as most people would who have read a lot of horror movies, but maybe she just doesn't give a crap. Anyway, I never used to wander around my own house in the dark, but once I had kids, you know, my greatest fear turned from, like, supernatural crap that doesn't exist to, like, their welfare. <laughs> so I'm, like, way more scared of, like, you know, the flu than I am ghosts right now. I mean, unless I've just watched a horror movie, then I'm bolting up the stairs as fast as I can. Um, my daughter... She's three, almost three and a half, and so she talks about this thing called the Nona Dusa. The Nona Dusa, I found out actually, is one of my sci-fi books that she just made up a title for it because she can't read yet. But uh, she was telling me that the Nona Dusa had long teeth, long teeth like a bear, and uh, long fingernails, and long sleeves covering her fingernails, and long black hair, and I'm like, what? And my husband and I are like, where is the Nona Dusa? Did you see her right now? <laughs> my toddler was like, no, she lives in the shed. I'm like, 
okay, at least she's in the shed. And then, like, I kid you not, like, two days later, we heard this huge bang in the middle of the night. And we're like, what was that? And the next day, the shed doors had blown off in the night. <laughs> now, the shed is old and literally falling apart. It, it was going to go at some point. We're going to rebuild it this summer. But um, <laughs> we were like, the Nona Dusa, <laughs> it's escaped. She's after us. And then the next night across the street, like literally facing the shed, like they can see the shed from our front yard, our neighbor went to the hospital. I was like, what's going on here? The Nona Dusa is after me. Uh, if I don't survive, uh, the Nona Dusa has got me. Do not come to my house. It's haunted. Anyway, uh, this book, <laughs> The Haunting of Gillespie House, it's not scary enough for veterans of the genre, I would say, but it has enough creepiness and a couple of good little jump scares to satisfy me, especially while I'm dealing with my own haunting. Elle herself was a likable character, but she's a little bit flat. You know, we get the bare minimum about her, but that allows her to kind of be a vehicle for the reader to ride out the mystery more than a character or study. I didn't really mind the lack of depth because this was a quick little book. The twist did catch me off guard. The novel does a good job misdirecting you towards the scratching of the walls and like whoever is haunting the place. The prose is solid, you know, it's easy to understand and flows with lots of tension and an active voice. I could have used more Baxter in the main villain though, and the novel, as I said, was very short. Yet, I would read another Darcy Coates if it popped up on BookBub. I'm giving it a 3 out of 5 stars, and I recommend it to anyone who likes kind of a light, haunting story. There was a funny exchange that I liked in the book. Um, a frying egg popped and spat hot oil at my exposed forearm. I glowered at it and used my spatula to squash the yolk, spilling its golden contents out like blood. That'll teach you. <laughs> that's like something I would do, so I was like, that's funny. I finished The Germantes Way in Search of Lost Time, Volume 3 this month by Marcel Proust, translated by C.K. Scott Moncrief. It's literary fiction. I'm not going to give you any re real review at all. If you want to hear my review of it, you can go to my Gramante's Way Part 8 video in my Proust Reflections playlist. Whew. The playlist, I've mentioned this before, is a reading of Proust starting with Volume 2 within a budding grove, and I did uh, about 120 pages a week, and then my reviews are recaps and highlights of my favorite moments from that 120 pages. It's very light. I also think I'm kind of funny. I talk about some of the historical stuff going on because that area of that era of time, like leading up to World War One and then kind of after World War One, is like kind of what I focused on in school, so I know kind of a lot about it. Anyway, I'm giving this particular version of Proust four to five because there's way too many rich people and rich people uh, suck. So yeah, sorry if you're rich and you're watching this, but you suck. Uh, <laughs> the last book that I read was The Unbroken by C.L. Clark. I received this as an ARC from NetGalley, but Orbit, the publisher, requested that no reviews be posted until two weeks before the book comes out. So I can't say anything about it until March 9th, so I'm going to be giving its own little, you know, one book review on that date. I gave it a five, four to five stars, though, I will say, and if you want to find out why, you have to chill out and wait for my video. Um, that's it. This month I am reading, in theory, <laughs> the Vicky Chambers book. Uh, one called Naked Truth, which is an indie book from Whispering Stories that I got. Uh, Sargasso of Space, which I mentioned. Um, a Diary in the Age of Water by Nina Mato. And uh, I'm listening, I might read one more, but I'm also listening to Salvage Crew, um, which is, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's narrated by Nathan Fillion. And uh, we'll see how long it takes me to get through that, because Nathan Fillion is hot, but he kind of mumbles. And so I can't put the book on 1.5 speed like I did the other one, so it's taking me longer to listen to it than I usually do, and I only listen to it when I'm walking my dog. And, uh, yeah, so there's my life for you. I'm walking dog, listening to books, reading books, being haunted. Thanks for watching.